We find ourselves in the Gospel of Luke, so take your Bibles and look with me at the 18th chapter of Luke. Luke chapter 18. You know, throughout the the history of this wonderful work of redemption that the Lord has been doing, um, the, the work has always involved a battle over truth, but the battle has raged hottest over one specific question, always at this point. There's always been one ultimate question over which this war between truth and lies has been the most hostile and the most explosive. And that question is this, how can a sinful human being be reconciled to a holy God? How can a sinful human being, a creature, corrupt and fallen, ever be reconciled to a perfect and holy God? And indeed, God is perfect. He's absolutely and totally righteous, and he cannot be otherwise. And yet, the pinnacle of his creation, mankind, made in God's own image, is very clearly not righteous. Not at all. Prior, of course, to the fall, Adam was sinless and in a state of, as we often say, untested holiness. He was always perfectly obeying, always walking in complete holiness. But when he sinned, everything changed. The obligation to obey and be perfect didn't change. God didn't change. His character didn't change. There's always the obligation of a creature made by God to measure up to who he is and to his standard because it's a reflection of him. And being made in his image, that's certainly the obligation of humanity to live like God. Leviticus chapter 11 said it in ancient times. You shall be Holy, for I am holy. That has always been the obligation. Fall or no fall. And so even after Adam sinned, everything changed. He's still obligated to all that God's holy character demands in thought and word and deed. Absolute obligation. But the light had gone out of Adam. His perfect knowledge of God's holiness and his untainted fellowship with God were lost And the result was that ever since that moment, ever since, mankind has been in a wholesale life and death pursuit of becoming justifiable, acceptable, self-justified. Every sinner is inwardly bent toward proving it, toward proving that our thoughts and our deeds don't actually fall short. That they do somehow, in some way, measure up. And they should get the due credit that mankind believes that they ought to get. And if, and if we do fall short in any area, we spend all our time trying to defend those gaffes, those what we like to call small little seismic anomalies. Mere tiny tremors in our moral life that have no bearing on on the fault line of our relationship with God. Absolutely none. Small, small things. They shouldn't be considered. But no matter how many different ways man tries to deny that there is a God, we can't seem to fully silence the nagging thought that all of our words and all of our deeds and all of our inner life will be finally and completely scrutinized and a verdict handed down. That nags God's creatures. And so we we have techniques. We have all kinds of techniques to silence those relentless pangs of guilt and anxiety over the way we live our lives. People may say they're not trying to do that, but they are. They, They do it in a variety of ways. They try to swallow up their loneliness and their despair by endless cycles of of entertaining weekends and socializing and gatherings with like people. Or we we drown out the loud voice of our conscience by either just ignoring it for as long as we can or medicating it or trampling it with more aggressive binges into destructive behavior. Or 
I mean, for some, they wallow in some sort of sophisticated self-pity. They, they hope that enough tears and emotional heartache will somehow relieve the burden. And after hitting perhaps some sort of rock bottom, we might call it, they often resolve to come out of that, come out of the ashes with a new Phoenix way of life, to, to sort of make better choices and get themselves on the right track, a more balanced, healthy lifestyle. Sometimes more conservative, less destructive group of friends. That'll make things better. And millions upon millions of people join religious groups of some kind. And they, they get immersed in that belief system. And they do whatever that system prescribes. You know, rituals and reciting prayers. Giving your time and your resources. Attending the functions, conforming to some moral code. And even entire cultures get steeped in a particular religious system for the entire group so that generations are born into it and they find that way of life, having been raised in it, a satisfying answer to the restless search for meaning. But it doesn't ultimately ever really give what it promises. All of that, of course, is built on those two basic falsehoods, those two basic lies. One, I can make myself acceptable before God. And two, sin's offense is not really as bad as some claim or the Bible says. That's, that's it right there. Man believes the lie that he can make himself better and with some measure of moral goodness make it by his own standard of righteousness. And his relationship with God might involve some less than perfect obedience, but He's, he's hopelessly entrenched in the notion that his own works will, in the end, be, be considered and, and probably good enough. And then that second lie follows it, that, that sin's offense against God is not really against some macro holy standard that's absolutely perfect. So therefore, it's not really worthy of any serious judgment. Are you kidding? So that's man's problem. We, we cannot help it. We don't think we're unholy. We don't see ourselves as unworthy, we don't think we're unable, and we're not really truly undone by any of it, despite that the scriptures are clearer than clear on this issue. Romans 3, probably one of the most notable passages, there are none righteous, not even one. And so the history, beloved, of fallen humanity is that there have always been attempts to do good things, to do good works, so that God would be satisfied and men and women would be acceptable in their own moral goodness. We call it self-justification. That's what we mean when we say that. Notice in Luke 18, verse 9, how it is described by Luke. He, he told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. You remember a couple chapters ago, uh, Jesus said, you, you leaders of Israel like to justify yourselves in the sight of men. That's this issue. You try to make yourself acceptable to, to be justified in the presence of God by your own good deeds. Now, on the opposite side of that is reality, spiritual reality. Whatever you may think, whatever someone may try to do, whatever technique they might use to imagine themselves acceptable with themselves and that God's going to just wink at it because offending his holiness is not that big of a deal. Whatever you may imagine, on the opposite side of that is, is the way things really are, the spiritual reality of it. The bombshell of where things really stand with man's relationship to his creator. And there's only those two paths. Only those two. One author explained it like this. Jesus repeatedly pointed out two things. The necessity of choosing whether to follow God or not, and the fact that choices are two and only two. Two gates, the narrow and the wide. Two ways, the narrow and the broad. Two destinations, life and destruction. Two groups, the few and the many. Two kinds of trees, the good and the bad, which produce two kinds of fruit, the good and the bad. Two kinds of people who profess faith in Jesus Christ, the sincere and the false. And two kinds of builders, the wise and the foolish. Two foundations, the rock and the sand. And two houses, the secure in the judgment and the faulty in the judgment. That's right. People don't see their sin for what it is. 
and the eternal consequences they're plunging toward. And yet it is God who reveals what sin is and coming short of his character is the, the very definition of it. Now, unbelievers who don't like to involve themselves in any religion still are angry at the mere suggestion that they'll give an account for their sins. Surely my life's not offensive. People who get involved in, in bizarre sort of cults are doing the same thing. They're trying to reach some spiritual place. Some, they're spiritualized people. They're, they're mystical in their paganism, and they want some sort of peace, some place that they've reached where the angst is no longer there, where the sin and the burden of it and the guilt is no longer there, however they might describe it. Mankind on his own does this and has since the fall. In fact, in Genesis 11, what did the monoculture across the earth do? They were a lingua franca. They all spoke the same language, all one culture across the globe. And they got together and said, we're going to make a name for ourselves. And they built a tower and they started building it to heaven. And so instead of letting them try to make a name for themselves, which would still fall short of the glory of God, God, in his grace, scattered them. He took away their ability to understand their mono language, their lingua franca, and they no longer could understand one another. Now they feared and they scattered across the earth so that God then could start working in pockets to redeem them from their foolishness. Israel, by the time Jesus is there in his ministry, has repeatedly worshipped their own righteousness, their own standard of righteousness. This has been always the case. And we see the same thing in the church today. I mean, so the so-called evangelical church has become weakened because we won't say what needs to be said. I mean, many so-called gospel ministries never tell people the truth. They don't. They don't. People are not clearly told that their good works earn nothing before God. Nothing, absolutely nothing. They're not told you can't justify yourself. In fact, the very opposite is true. In these churches, sin is not what the Bible says it is. We, we just redefine it, excuse it, dumb it down, do whatever we can to put a gloss on it. Having power over worldliness, well, that's overrated. Why would you do that? I mean, you have to fit in somewhere. You can't always be nitpicking. God would never judge anyone's sin. I had a pastor in town tell me that very thing. He said, yeah, there might be a hell, but nobody's going there. I'm thinking, please don't say that to anyone. In fact, get, um, get out of the ministry. What in the world? Just read your Bible. That's literally what he said. He's too loving. Churches tell people that all the time. Repentance is not required for salvation. You, sh you don't have to turn from yourself or self-worship or guilt or sin or anything. And living in obedience to Jesus Christ, that's not necessarily the fruit of true conversion. You can say you love Jesus and your life never changed. As long as you attend church here and there. As long as you pray now and then. As long as you give donations once in a while, as long as you don't break the law, and I mean by that the big ones, you know, murder and thievery and criminal behavior, the little things, you know, the Lord doesn't really care about the little things. And as, as long as you say you're a Christian and you try to follow the gentle, kind example of Jesus, protect the oppressed and defend the helpless and try to be loving at least to most people who deserve it, this is the message that goes out from a lot of so-called gospel ministries. Do these things, God will be pleased, you'll be acceptable in his sight, and all will be well. But the problem, beloved, is so clear. God's standard isn't man's works. His standard is his own character, right? You shall be holy for I'm holy. Peter said it in 1 Peter 1 verse 16, quoting Leviticus 11. You shall be perfect. As I am perfect, the standard God demands is absolute perfection through perfect obedience. And so that brings us to the question, how can a sinner who isn't perfect be reconciled to such a holy God who cannot wink at sin? I can't make myself acceptable. The prophet said, 
In Isaiah 64, 6, any righteousness I do, any righteousness you do, it's filthy. And Psalm 143, verse 2 says, And do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. No one. That's right. And so we come to another crucial moment in our Lord's ministry as he goes after this issue with the unbelieving crowd around him. Notice verse 9. I'll read through verse 14. He told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, and he viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled And he who humbles himself will be exalted. So here we have it. Once again, as at other times, Luke gives us the point of the parable right up front. He told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. So it was obvious that in the mass of people listening to Jesus, there were countless numbers of them that thought that their religious practices or their moral goodness or their heritage gave them a favorable verdict before God. They were, he says, trusting in themselves, present tense verb. This is their pattern of life. Their way of life is self-justifying. I am okay. You should accept me as okay. God accepts me as okay. How do you know? Because I, I think it. I believe it. I declare it. I justify myself. And that that self-inflated view is what causes them then to look at others as you would expect. Well, you're not practicing the discipline that I practice, so my way of life is superior according to my standard. So you're, you're you're not doing the same thing. You're not favored by God. You're not praying as I do, so you're not up to the good moral standard that I live by. So you're not favored by God. You're not good enough for his admiration as I am. And because that's the case, you are nothing to me because I declare you're nothing to God like I am. I'm something to him. You're nothing. So Jesus presents a parable to deal with that issue right in front of him. And he presents two worshipers. If you're just keeping an outline, there's your, there's your first marker. Two worshipers. Verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax gatherer. You know, the Lord is so amazingly genius, not just because he's God, but he knows exactly what to do in the, in the moment when he's dealing with a certain group of people. And he wants to not be vague, but ultimately clear about the gospel. The story is short. The details, not very many. And yet it gets right at the heart of the issue. And side by side, he puts into the the image the temple and prayer times and two individuals. One is a Pharisee and one and the other is the tax gatherer or some of your translations say tax collector. We're already familiar with the Pharisees. Among Israel's leaders and the religious elite, there were groups of leaders in Israel. One group was the Pharisees. They were the ones who were experts in the law of God, uh, in the exact application of it. So they took the law of God and they tried to model how you obey it to be righteous. And they held people and scrutinized them tightly to that standard. That, That was the Pharisees and Jesus had to deal with them all the time. Next to them were the scribes, the doctors of the law and its interpretation. They and the Pharisees were uh, always sort of in arguments about interpreting the Old Testament and its application. 
Uh, and yet they were the sort of elite that traveled together in bands and held people to these standards while they themselves lifted themselves over others. They were this familiar band of hypocrites. And he is set right alongside a tax collector or some translations say, you know, the, the outcast or the publican. Now, we've talked about these before. In fact, in Luke 5, you remember Matthew was saved. Matthew was one of these. These were part of the Jewish community that had been approached by Rome, and Rome offered them some sort of way to uh, be an instrument of Rome to get taxes, and in so doing, it would be a franchise that would earn them a living. And so they would go against their brethren, not the mere fact that they were tax collectors for Rome, but the fact that they would extort money at Rome's taxation levels and for their own profit make even more exorbitant taxes and put them on the people. This was the tax collector, absolutely hated, vilified for selling out, using these franchises to get rich on their own countrymen. They were very good at it. They had sort of tentacles into the worst of society. They were extortionists at the worst level. And they had two basic categories they used very often. If you weren't in our study of Luke 5, the, the first was sort of the larger taxation category called the Gavai. And the Gavai was property taxes and income taxes and things like that. The larger things that everyone expected to pay. And they charged exorbitant amounts for that. We are very familiar with, with being charged what we think is unfair uh, in terms of tax rates. This is common in, in uh, authorities ordained by God and yet not always righteous. Well, it was terrible in first century Rome and the Jews uh, who came under this as part of the community of Israel had to go to their, their countrymen, these tax collectors, and pay these huge tariffs on those larger categories. And then they had the Mokesh, which was a category uh, of, of all the small ways that they were nickeled and dimed until they had no more resources. All the taxation on life's little necessities, every marketplace trade beyond what we might even imagine in terms of sale tax, commerce and imports and exports, goods and services, the use of roads and things like that, the normal stuff we would pay taxes for, they paid huge taxes for in order to line the pockets of their own countrymen who had sold out on them. And they just created fees, fees for traveling the smallest distances, fees for your animals, your tools, your equipment, your supplies, delivery services, etc. And everybody knew they were tied to the underworld of society, the criminal elements. They were hated for that in general. They were lovers of money and known for it. Jesus puts that kind of an individual in the parable next to the holy one of society, the one who is, up, who is living by the law of God ostensibly, the one who is seen as righteous, who's given up all those things. They don't cheat anyone. They don't lie to anyone. They don't hide anything in their life. They are model citizens in terms of obeying the law. They're, they're moving toward the righteousness of God in their character, and they're, they're teaching things they actually live Jesus wants the backdrop of the story to be human beings trying equally to relate to God. So he has them praying in the temple. So both men are portrayed as coming before God, as talking to God, which implies that they're both sending the message that they both need God, at least to whatever degree they think. And so a relationship with God is envisioned. In other words... If you're a Jew in the crowd, you're thinking, well, I know, I know who's favored by God in that pairing. And I know who's not going to have any of God's ear in that pairing. It's clearly the spiritual leader that's going to be heard by God. And this tax collector has no business being in the temple, doesn't belong. And the presumption of praying, well, I mean, step away from that guy because lightning's coming. This would have been in the crowd's thinking. Notice the Pharisees' outlook. That's where Jesus begins in the story. 
Verse 11, the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. Now this is interesting because the details Jesus leaves here, though, though scant, are, are filling out the picture here that, that really does lead people in their minds to a particular outcome if they believe you can work your way to heaven or justify yourself. First of all, the Pharisee, Jesus says, is, has taken a bold display here. Not only is he praying constantly, that's the tense of the verb here, he's going on praying constantly, but Jesus mentions that he stood, which is to say, in contrast, unlike the publican who stands far away, this guy's up front. So, so he takes the, the most prominent place at the center of the temple area to pray, That is the implication here. He's up front where he could be recognized as spiritual for his prayers and be heard. Matthew 5 verse 6, Jesus said, Don't be like the hypocrites when you pray, who love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners in order to be seen by men. That's right. This is a bold display of his view of himself in the presence of God during prayer. And notice it says that he's praying this to himself. Look, some commentators have thought, well, that must mean that he's whispering. It isn't the verb and the construction here at all. The construction in the original does not indicate that he's praying in a whisper, but that he's directing the prayer toward what he wants to say and imply about himself. So he's praying this for himself or about himself, talking to God, but highlighting himself. That is the point. In fact, you could translate it into something like this. He was praying all the things that favor himself. That's right. This is a bold posture, and you can see why, because the declaration he makes is full of boasting. Verse 11, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. (laughs) Now stop right there for a moment. When you thank God, what? When you say, Lord, I thank you, what's the next thing that ought to come from a Christian's mouth? For something you've done. Something about you, something about who you are, something you've done for me that I could not do for myself. I thank you for who you are, what you mean to me, what you've done for me, what you are doing for me. And Jesus just tightens this thing down and says, look, in this story, the Pharisee starts out with a pretense. God, I thank you that I am not like other men. And this is, this is like saying, God, I thank you that you recognize how great I am and how favored I am by all that, that exists. And therefore, perk up, Lord, listen to me. A pretense of thanksgiving to God, but really talking about who he is in and of himself. And he thanks God, quote unquote, that he's not like, and he names some things. This is mind-boggling. Swindlers. Um, Robbers, in some of your translations. Just the normal word for someone who does shady deals, takes advantage of people with thievery, things like that. Swindling. And then when I read that, that first one in the list, I'm like, really? Okay, wow, that's interesting. So, so like the parable of the, the man on the road to Jericho that gets beaten up and left for dead, and, uh, and the good Samaritan comes along, maybe, maybe this guy imagines, hey, I've never been among the brigands that, that take somebody's money on the road to Jericho from behind some, some back alley up there in the rock formations. I've never been that. But you're not a swindler, are you sure? You, you have no problem taking exorbitant temple taxes from some poor widow. The Pharisees were known for, 
extorting money from people who had very little, if any, to give. And the entire Jewish leadership was known for making back alley deals and getting rich by by holding their religious authority over people who were less advantaged. They were known for it. That was the whole story of the widow's mites, the Jesus watching the, the Jewish leaders taking resources. When Jesus comes to Jerusalem in his ministry as the sort of the first miracle that he does at a wedding of Cana, remember he went into the Temple Mount and, and they were marketing the sacrificial system by making money on people and taking advantage of them in ways that, that they didn't need the money, but they took it and robbed from them. And this was going on under the leadership of the Sanhedrin. It was going on under the elite religious leadership of Israel. They were known for it. You're, really? You're not a swindler? You support a whole system that swindles. Unjust, I'm not unjust like other men. Characterize, this is a verb that means characterized by, by just violating the law of God. Well, you have an outward appearance of conforming, but Jesus would say to them often, you know, you wrote a bunch of traditions for how to apply the law, but you took the heart right out of those commands and wanted to just appear to be righteous. And so he would say to one of the Pharisees, you know, I know, I know you tithe your mint and your cumin and your dill. I know you do that, but you've neglected the heavier provisions that are within the law, like mercy and justice and forgiveness. You don't do those things. In Romans 2, he says, you're not going to get any leniency from God in the judgment. Do you who say do not steal, do you steal? You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who say this, and he just goes down the list. You, you claim to be teachers of the law, and yet you break the law. Do you not break it? What do you mean you're not unjust? You find ways to get around it all the time. And perhaps this man has been faithful to his spouse, but what about turning a blind eye to the rampant immorality among, among Israel's leaders? To say nothing of spiritual adultery, or they led... God's people away from the worship of God, the true and living God, and led God's people sometimes for generations away from waiting for a Messiah, trusting in the Messiah, the only one. By the time Jesus arrives, they're in spiritual adultery at the most hardened level. And then Jesus just adds this dagger. The Pharisee prays, as well, I thank you, God, that I'm not like this tax collector. Man. So now the Pharisee is referencing the other guy in the room. And what an ironic statement. I thank you, God, I'm not like him. Oh, you aren't like him. In fact, you're nothing like him. The Pharisee means it to condescend, as verse 9 says, to view the tax collector with contempt and everyone in the crowd would think that oh absolutely you treat that guy with contempt you're a criminal you shouldn't even be in the house of prayer you don't belong in the temple you have no status you've not done anything that would measure up to God I mean we look at people that way don't we oh well you're not good enough you're not morally this you're not morally that Next week, I'm going to deal with this issue in part two, the implications for the Christian's life from this very principle. But, beloved, we do it sometimes in our heart all the time. I'm above you because I do this, 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 this. I have this, 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 this. And disunity and disruption comes to the church, and dereliction in our own Christian growth happens because we have the same attitude. What a dagger that Jesus puts in this story. I'm glad I'm not like the tax collector. That's right, you're not anything like him. So here's the heart of it. Don't miss the heart of it. This is the Pharisees' outlook. Condescension toward fellow sinners. Why? Because he's above them. He's above them, and he expects God to see him that way. So he can condescend. He feels a right to condescend. Notice also what is missing from his prayer. No confession of any sin or admission of guilt. <laughs> no confession. You know, when people say, I'm, I, I really want Christ, and you tell them, well, you have to, you have to know 
the spiritual condition you're in and what you have to confess. And they start to backpedal. You know that person is not interested in the God of the Bible yet. They might be being drawn. They may need uh, more conviction, and certainly they must have it. But until they come to the place where they are already piling up confessions and admissions of their own guilt and unworthiness, they are not interested in the gospel of Scripture. You don't believe me? Look at 1 John chapter 1. Keep your finger in Luke 18, and time is flying, so let's do this quickly. 1 John 1. I mean so, so clear. Somebody tells you, look, what do you mean that that I'm a bad person like you say. I'm not, not a bad person. I'm not trying to be a bad person. I, I take care of my family. I earn a good paycheck. and I've, I've nursed them from childhood. I, I try to be nice to people. Now, it's really hard with some of the people I work with, but I try to even be nice to those people. And, and you know, I mean, I give. We've given to charitable causes. We're over here involved in, in this thing that helps, you know, unwed mothers and pregnancies that are unwanted. And I'm over here doing, I mean, what do you mean I'm a bad person? Here's what is meant. Verse 5. This is the message we've heard from him and announced to you that God is light. And in him there's no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in the darkness, my life, my heart, my desires are the old life. What I am when I love myself and love the world and just live for myself. If I walk in that as the customary, comfortable life that I live then I am lying when I say I have fellowship with God and I don't practice the truth. Christians do at times fall into darkness, but we don't walk in it. And when we say we have intimate fellowship with God through Christ, it is because we see the power of God in our life, having repented and given our life completely to Christ by faith. And the beginning process of increasing practicing of the truth happens in our life. It's what we want, though it's imperfect. It's what we desire and pursue, even though we stumble. But if you walk around in the darkness and say you have fellowship with, with God, you lie. You don't practice the truth. Verse 8. If you say... If we say that we have no sin, that's a reference to no sin that condemns us, no guilt. If I say I have no guilt, I'm not guilty, I'm not a bad person. Then you're deceiving yourself and the truth isn't in you. He gets more specific, verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, that is to say I can't think of a single thing against my conscience for which I would have to call it sin. So I'm not guilty before God, and I can't point to any actual sins. And you make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Back to Luke 18. Notice the guy doesn't do any confessing of any sin or any admission of guilt. Why? Because he's not a sinner in his mind. He He hasn't got anything confessing to bring before the Lord. And therefore, he doesn't have any need for forgiveness He's absolved himself. He's looked at the things that anyone would be able to show him, well, you fell short over here. Yeah, but I mean, you know, it's compared with all the things I did. That erases that, cancels out that. Well, you, you know, are you sure your heart is right over here? Well, you know, yeah, I'm faithful to these people, but my heart does sometimes go there. But that, you know... I still don't do it on the outside. Yeah, but what about on the inside? Well, I mean, the good outweighs the bad. Come on. God's going to make a big deal out of those things? Really? Absolutely no confession whatsoever. In fact, the opposite, verse 12. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all I get. I love this because Jesus doesn't include all the things a Pharisee would say. I mean, when he gets in public in the prayers that that Jesus chides in Matthew 5... In the Sermon on the Mount, man, they are just out in the public square praying big prayers, lengthy prayers. They love the long prayers. 
Jesus just includes two things here. I uh, pay tithes and I fast. What, what's Jesus trying to represent here? Well, first of all, tithing and, and uh, fasting, the, the giving of the Old Testament is Jewish taxation system and fasting were ways that you honored God by obeying his commands directly and sacrificed for God in order to meet some spiritual need. Those were the two practices. When you tithe, you paid your taxation to the theocracy, which was Israel, and that went to it. That wasn't your offering. Your offerings in the Old Testament were free will offerings, and they were given out of your heart of love for God. Tithing was always taxation in the Old Testament for the nation of Israel. And then fasting, fasting was a way to, to say no to the daily needs so that you could pray and you could demonstrate to God that you were undistracted in this prayer need that's desperate on your heart. And, and it, it was just a way to get some of the distractions of the daily comforts of life out of the way so you could pray with, with a faithful heart. And Jesus includes this too as the things that the Pharisee highlights most. I fast, everybody knows that. And I pay tithes. Everybody knows that. Why? Because he went into the public square, tooted the horn, and brought out his alms and gave them in front of everybody's visual. And when it came to fasting and throwing uh, dust and ashes on his head so he could look like he was in grief as he represented the sins of the people, he tooted the horn, put the carpet down in the middle of the intersection, and went out there and said, See, I sacrifice meals to pray for you. I love that, the way the Lord did that. Notice the publican's outlook. Oh, so little said and yet so profound. But the tax collector, the guy who has no right, the guy who the Pharisee thinks ought to be booted out of there, if not lightning bolted out, he's standing some distance away. He's not up at the front. He's not outside of earshot, but he's not up at the front. And he's even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven. That was, that was how you went before God and you either asked a priest to make the priestly gesture of representing you to God with his eyes and his hands up, or you offered the, the palms of your hands with your eyes up, pleading for mercy and asking God to check your life. That was the open palms. I know sometimes today the, the desire to open your life up in, in a worship service and in music and things, people put their hands up, but they've confused it sometimes with lifting up holy hands, which was an Old Testament gesture for examine my life. And this guy won't even believe he's worthy enough to lift up his eyes to speak to God. He has that humbled, brought low disposition that says, I have no worthiness. He's also beating his breast. What is that? It's an outward display of grief. And this, by, by implication, is spontaneous. This is just an outward display of grief, and that's how they displayed it. It would be like you and I sobbing and saying, what in the world? God should snuff me out. You say, how do you get all that from just those gestures? Because of what he says. God be merciful to me, the sinner. Two important things you need to know. God be merciful is too generic a translation. The verb actually means, Lord, take my sin away and cover me um, to protect me from your wrath. So it has the two ideas that we talk about in the sacrifice of Christ. The propitiation of God's wrath. Satisfying of God's wrath in a perfect sacrifice. And then the expiation of my sins, sent away, my guilt is gone. That is in this term. It's the literal term for propitiation. Satisfy your wrath on my behalf. Cover me, protect me from it by sending away my guilt. That's what he's asking. So he's admitting guilt, unworthiness. I, don't, I shouldn't be here. I don't need right to be here. But I'm crying out to you because I know I know my shame. He's got an ashamed disposition. People today, when you give them the gospel, or they come from churches where the gospel isn't really taught with clarity, they don't feel any shame at all. I came to Jesus. It's like they picked up a phone and dialed a number. Yeah, yeah, I know Jesus. Have you ever been ashamed of your sins? 
It's a spirit-produced thing in true conversion. I'm unworthy. I don't know whether there will be tears or ever was tears in your conversion. But if you're in Christ, you came ashamed of your sin and what it does to destroy a soul and how you offended God, no matter how you articulated it. And there's a humble divulging of his guilt, the sinner. It's almost like, and the, the definite article is there. It's almost like I'm the only one in the room. I don't see the Pharisee. Have you ever noticed that? Pharisee says, I'm, not, I'm glad I'm not like him. This guy didn't even notice the Pharisee. Be merciful to me, the sinner. The sinner in the room, the one that deserves your wrath. That's me. That's, that's what I am here. Sometimes when we've shared the gospel with family members, we'll be talking about how unworthy we were of the salvation that God has given. And family members, lost family members will say, what are you talking about? What do you mean you're not worthy? I say, we're not. I, I, I'm not. I can't merit Christ's sacrifice. God reached down into our darkness. He moved on our hearts. He saved us. He rescued us. We are not worthy. And they'll say, no, you are. Don't say that. You are worthy. You ever had that happen? You are worthy. Don't say that. Now, I know what a lost person is thinking. Look, you don't want to have some morbid, you know, self-loathing where, where you look at other people as worth nothing and you're worth nothing. No. To each other, we're made in the image of God and should never curse one another. We're peers as human beings. We protect human life. Why? Because it's worth protecting so far as we're concerned. But in the presence of God, nope. Unworthy. The only thing we're worthy of is condemnation as sinners. And that's what this guy says. I'm unworthy. How did he get there? Well, I've seen the Pharisees' outlook and the publicans' outlook. Here's the Lord's final word on it. I tell you. Verse 14. This man went to his house justified. What does that mean? I mean, what a shock. The Pharisee isn't justified? Really? He's not acceptable to God? No, he's not. Because he's already self-justified. Look, if you self-justify, God, God, God's not going to justify you. Because he's the only one that can deliver, as Psalm 108 said. If you move God out of the way and you self-justify, that's all you get, that you have your reward. In eternity, you get nothing. But this man went down to his house justified? Yes, he's acceptable to God. Why? Because he came by faith. How do we know? Everyone who exalts himself will be crushed, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Man, if you exalt yourself, then you will be humbled because in the judgment you won't survive. But if you come before the Lord and say, take my guilt away in Christ, Cover me with his perfection because I bring nothing. My best works are shameful. My best outward work, man, if you knew my heart behind some of it, you would just, oh, I cringe to think of my heart behind some works. My best works. This man says, I'm unworthy. And God says, that's, that's the work of real humility. That's a work of God. That's real faith. That's what justifies. And so there it is, beloved. Evangelical churches, ministries, your ministry to lost souls around you, don't confuse the issue. Don't confuse it. Somebody says they want to come to Jesus, but they, they don't want to go before the Lord and be like the publican. Humbling themselves, I'm unworthy, I bring nothing. My family growing up as Christians doesn't mean anything. That is not, it's a wonderful gift from the Lord, but that doesn't make me acceptable in God's sight. My own righteousness, my own good deeds, my own moral goodness, years and years of sacrifice, orphanage work, whatever care, protection of the oppressed, it doesn't matter. You could live your whole life and give Everything in the ultimate sacrifice, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, but without the love of God coursing through your veins, it's zero. It's just noise. Acceptable to God by his work. How does a human being 
a sinner ever get reconciled with the Creator? Not by anything I've, I've done. Everything Christ has done for us and every, everything in His sacrifice that satisfied His Heavenly Father for us. Only by faith in Him and turning from yourself can you be reconciled to the Creator even though you still are a sinner. That's the only way. So there's only one path. Which will you choose? Part two and its implications next time. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the grace of such a short parable, but, but so sharp and penetrating and explosive. Lord, there's no reason for the church to be confused. And yet we see it all the time. We're, we're trying to find another way into the kingdom. Satan loves to provide some other way and all kinds of false teachers and false notions to get there. And our flesh loves it so because we would rather slide people in than have them come to the scandal of their own shame before you and we, we don't like talking about that shame sometimes because we know that's what it took to save us. And we get ashamed of the gospel because of the hostility that it creates when men do not want to confess their guilt. But the way things really are doesn't change. Everyone's condemned. And I pray that we'd have a ministry that reflects having come like the tax collector and that we get rid of any vestige of anything that would self-justify in your presence. Oh God, keep us from such blindness and destruction. Make us a light in these truths. And we ask it in Jesus' name, our deliverer, our only hope, Amen.